Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to the Book of Mormon podcast. This is going to be for 3rd Nephi, Chapter 8. So let's get into this one. So a little introduction here before we get into the scriptures themselves. I just want to read you a couple of things uh, in preparation for it. First of all, the time of Christ's visit to the Nephites in America could have been as much as 9 to 12 months after his ascension into heaven, following his ministry among his disciples in the Old World. It may be that he waited for the Nephites to be physically ready for him before his visit. He gave them time to fix their temple and repair their homes prior to his visit. His visit may coincide with the timing of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was to celebrate the harvest. This may also be the timing of the Second Coming. Philip McConkie said, The Nephites adjusted their calendar so as to begin a new dating era with the birth of Jesus, and according to their chronology, the storms in the darkness and the crucifixion came to pass on the fourth day of the first month of the 34th year. Then, in the ending of that year, several months after the ascension on Olivet, Jesus ministered personally among the Nephites for many hours on many days. He came as a man descending out of heaven, introduced himself as God, as the God of Israel, permitted the multitude to feel the prints of the nails in his hands and feet, and to thrust their hands into his side, called a quorum of twelve, gave them keys and powers and authorities, healed the, the Nephite sick, and introduced the sacramental ordinance in the Western Hemisphere, taught the people in plainness, and with an excellence surpassing much that was done in his Palestinian ministry, gave them the gift of the Holy Ghost and ascended to his Father. So let's go ahead and get into this one. Uh, we're going to begin now. This will be the time frame and he will, will be at the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 1, Now it came to pass that according to our record, and we know our record to be true, for behold, it was a just man who did keep the record, for he truly did many miracles in the name of Jesus. Remember, this is Nephi, the son of Nephi, the son of Helaman, that's doing this record. And there was not any man who could do a miracle in the name of Jesus, save he were cleansed every whit from his iniquity. Hartman Rector Jr. said, The prophet Mormon stated very plainly what I like to call the qualification for the performance of miracles. So this is the qualification. We must be cleansed every whit from our iniquity. When I first read this passage of scripture, I felt to say, Hooray for repentance, for if it were not for repentance, there could be no miracles performed. Elder Charles K. Callis said, isn't this a clarion call to purity of life? The clearer, the cleaner our lives, the purer our thoughts, the greater will be our power by the, by the prayer of faith to heal those who are afflicted with bodily ills. It is the truth that the, mighty, that the many mighty miracles that Jesus the Redeemer wrought was due to the fact that he lived so close to the Father, lived so perfectly the celestial laws of God that unto him was given that superhuman power. Verse 2, <clears throat> And now it came to pass, if there was no mistake made by this man in the reckoning of our time, the thirty and third year had passed away, and the people began to look with great earnestness for the sign. Are we looking earnestly for the signs of Jesus' the second coming? Which had been given by the prophet Samuel the Lamanite, yea, for the time that there should be darkness for the space of three days over the face of the land. And there began to be great doubtings and disputations among the people, notwithstanding so many signs had been given. And it came to pass in the thirty and fourth year, in the first month, on the fourth day of the month, the New Testament account of the crucifixion of Christ would seem to indicate that the Savior was crucified the very week he became thirty-three years of age. The Book of Mormon not only substantiates this account, but also provides us with an exact date of the crucifixion. According to the Nephite calendar system, the Savior was crucified in the thirty and fourth year, in the first month, on the fourth day of the month. Although we are not certain when the first month of the Nephite calendar would occur, if the Nephites were using the same calendar system as the Hebrews, the first month would be in the spring of the year, sometime between about the middle of March and the middle of April. That was by Daniel Ludlow. Orson Pratt said, We find that the ancient Israelites on this continent had a sign given of the exact time of the crucifixion and a revelation of the exact time of the Savior's birth. And according to their reckoning, they made... They made him 33 years and a little over three days old from the time of his birth to the time that he hung upon the cross. 
It is generally believed and conceded by the learned who have investigated the matter that, that Christ was born on, in April. I have seen several accounts, some of them published in our periodicals, of learned men in different nations in which it is stated that according to the best of their judgment from the researches they have made, Christ was crucified on the 6th of April. That is the day on which this church was organized. Continuing back to verse 5, there arose a great storm, such an one as never had been known in all the land. Orson Pratt said, For the Lord has said in, the, in this book, which has been published for 38 years, that if they will not repent, he will throw down all their strongholds and cut off the cities of the land and will execute vengeance and fury on the nation, even as upon the heathen, such as they have not heard that he will send a desolating scourge on the land, that he will leave their cities desolate without inhabitants. For instance, the great, powerful, and populous city of New York, that may be considered one of the greatest cities of the world, will be in a few years become a mass of ruins. The people will wonder, while gazing on the ruins that cost hundreds of millions to build, what, what has become of its inhabitants. Their houses will be there, but <clears throat> they will be left desolate. So saith the Lord God, that will be only a sample of numerous other towns and cities on the face of this continent. <clears throat> Verse 6. And there was also a great and terrible tempest, and there was, a te there was terrible thunder, insomuch that it did shake the whole earth, as if it was about to divide asunder. Hugh Nibley said, If you go into books on earthquakes and check this out, you'll see that the order of the events is all very correct and accurate. The Book of Mormon just describes a number 12 earthquake. Number 8 on the Richter scale might do it, but the Assam earthquake in August of 1950 was 12 on the scale. Remember, every time you go up a number, you double the strength of the earthquake. So you can imagine what a 12 would be if the San Francisco earthquake was a 7.5 at the extreme. So this is some earthquake, and the order in which the events are described is very good here. All the things that should take place. So we've summed up there, we've summed them up here in this very factual account, 3 Nephi chapter 8. Well, it was a terror, about 11 or 12 on the on the Wood-Newman scale. It is probably not the worst earthquake on record because Assam was total destruction. And in this one, we're told there were some cities which remained. It was not total. It describes what happened at the epicenter. There were cities that remained, whereas in the great Assam earthquake of 1950, the damage was total over a large area. I'm going to read you an account of that Assam earthquake. On August 15, 1950, there was an earthquake in Tibet that was total over 10,000 square miles and killed 500,000 people. Only 14 people survived. <clears throat> Imagine an earthquake that killed 500,000 people over that area. Well, here's a description of it. On the morning of August 15, 1950, the day of the biggest and strangest earthquake in our times, it gave no inkling of what was to come. All of a sudden, just this terrible storm and then the earthquake. All the seismographs in the world went mad. The energy unleashed was the equivalent of three million atomic bombs. Stranger things were to follow. By all the rules, the scene of the cataclysm should have been invaded by reporters, scientists, and relief workers. Nothing. It was just wiped out completely. Instead, they didn't even have to bother. They were afraid of the Chinese going in there. That's the Chinese border with Tibet. No worry after that. The map had completely changed. Where there had been rivers before, there were mountains now. Rivers that ran in one direction now ran in the other direction. President Benson said, In the Book of Mormon we find a pattern for preparing for the Second Coming. A major portion of the book centers on the few decades just prior to Christ's coming to America. By careful study of that time period, we can, we can determine why some were destroyed in the terrible judgments that preceded his coming, and what brought others to stand at the temple in the land bountiful and thrust their hands into the wounds of his hands and feet. President Kimball said, These tremendous convulsions of nature not only impressed the Nephites greatly, so that they recorded them in their history, but the memory of them also stayed in the minds of the Lamanites or the American Indians for 1,500 years. Shortly after the discovery of America, the Catholic missionaries and explorers learned that the American Indians had a tradition of the great convulsions of nature that took place at the time of Christ's death. For example, I would like to quote from a Lamanite, an Indian prince named, and I can't pronounce his name, but it's a strange name, who lived near the city of Mexico and wrote his book in 1600 AD. The sun and the moon eclipsed, and the earth trembled, and the rocks broke, and many other things and signs took place. This happened at the same time when, when Christ our Lord suffered, and they say it happened during the first days of the year. 
The destructions that occurred at Christ's death may be a type of what to expect at the second coming. Here's a list of similar events that occurred at Christ's death and those prophesied at the second coming. The Nephi destruction was a, a great storm and the destructions at the second coming will be an overflowing rain and great hailstones. There will be a terrible thunder, uh, exceedingly sharp lightnings, fire uh, upon the earth. Moroni did sink into the depths of the city, the city thereof. The waves of the sea shall heave themselves beyond their bounds. Uh, the whole land of the face, uh, the whole face of the land was changed. That'll happen in our day. Uh, many were slain. Some were carried away in the whirlwind. The rocks were rent in twain. There were darkness upon the face of the land. The inhabitants could feel the vapor of darkness. They were they heard the cry and mourn of people. And then when the storms come, we're supposed to stand in holy places. Lance Wickman said, climbing atop the Mount of Olives with his disciples, the Savior prophesied the cataclysmic events that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem and his second coming. He then issued this portentous admonition to his disciples, ancient and modern. Then you shall stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Latter-day revelations provide understanding. They teach that in our day, amidst strife and catastrophe and pestilence, there are two kingdoms locked in grim struggle for the souls of men, Zion and Babylon. More than once, they repeat the injunction to stand in holy places for a refuge from these storms of, of latter-day life. Prominent among such holy places and key to all the others is the temple of the Lord. Now back to the scriptures, verse 7. And there were exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never had been known in all the land. And the city of Zarahemla did take fire, and the city of Moroni did sink in the depths of the sea. And the inhabitants thereof were drowned, and the, and the earth was carried up upon the city of Moroni, ha, that in the place of the city there became a great mountain. And there was a great and terrible destruction in the land southward, but behold, there was a more great and terrible destruction in the land northward, for behold, the whole face of the land was changed because of the tempest and the whirlwinds and the thunderings and the lightnings and the exceedingly great quaking of the whole earth. And the highways were broken up and the level roads were spoiled and many smooth places became rough. And many great and notable cities were sunk and many were burned and many were shaken till the buildings thereof had fallen to the earth and the inhabitants thereof were slain and the places were left desolate. And there were some cities which remained, but the damage thereof was exceedingly great, and there were many in them who were slain. And there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind, and whither they went no man knoweth, save they know that they were carried away. And thus the face of the whole earth became deformed, because of the tempests and the thunderings and the lightnings and the quaking of the earth. And behold, the rocks were rent in twain, they were broken up upon the face of the whole earth, insomuch that they were found in broken fragments and in seams and in cracks upon all the face of the land. These scenes are of value to us, not alone because they detail the events on the American continent some two millennia ago, but also because they typify what lies ahead. A study of, fourth, of third and fourth Nephi is of inestimable worth in our coming to understand how to prepare for the second coming of the Son of Man and also what life will be like during the millennium. That was by Millet McConkie. Verse 19, And it came to pass that when the thunderings and the lightnings and the storm and the tempest and the quaking of the earth did cease, for behold, they did last for about the space of three hours, this time frame may have coincided with the three final hours that the Savior was on the cross prior to his death, which would have been from noon until three o'clock in Jerusalem. And it was said by some that the time was greater. Nevertheless, all these great and terrible things were done in about the space of three hours. And then, behold, there was darkness upon the face of the land. The time of the commencement of the darkness may coincide with the Savior's death, and the lifting of the darkness may coincide with the Savior's resurrection. Christ hung upon the cross for a period of about six hours, from, from approximately 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. It was during the last three hours that darkness covered the land, as apparently the agonies of Gethsemane returned. Of this period, Elder McConkie wrote, he will continue to suffer the curses of crucifixion for another three hours until around 3 p.m. when he voluntarily gives up the ghost. Of these coming hours, Matthew and Mark say only that it was a period when there was darkness over all the land. Luke extends this turning of day into night over a greater area. There was a darkness over all the earth, he says, and the sun was darkened. The fact of the darkness, for which there is no known scientific explanation, is known to us. But it's perhaps, but its purpose and what happened during those three seemingly endless hours remain outside the bounds of our understanding. Could it be that this was the period of his greatest trial, or that during it the agonies of Gethsemane recurred and even intensified? 
that this darkness did cover the whole earth, we surmise from the Book of Mormon account, the, the Nephite prophets had spoken messianically of three days of darkness that would be a sign unto them of the crucifixion of Christ. At that time the rocks would rend, and there would be such upheavals in nature that those on the isles of the sea would say, The God of nature suffers. The Nephite records tell us tell of the fulfillment of these prophecies, of the darkness and storms and destructions that then occurred, of cities sinking into the seas, of mountains and valleys being created, of the rocks rending and the whole face of the earth being deformed. It is of more than passing import that the storms and tempests and earthquakes lasted for about the space of three hours, and then there was darkness upon the face of the land. <clears throat> Verse 20, And it came to pass that there was thick darkness upon all the face of the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof had not, who had not fallen could feel the vapor of darkness. And there could be no light because of the darkness, neither candles, neither torches, neither could there be fire kindled with their fine and exceedingly dry wood, so that they could not, there could not be any light at all. And there was not any light seen, neither fire nor glimmer, neither the sun nor the moon nor the stars, for so great were the mists of darkness which were upon the face of the land. Hugh Nibley said, This, like much else in the account, that God did send down fire and destroy them, suggests nearly nearby volcanic activity. And indeed, in many cases, earthquakes are the preparation for the volcano that follows, as in the Chilean 1960 quake, which triggered the activity of long dormant volcanoes in the area. Most of the victims of the great catastrophes of Pompeii, St. Saint Pierre, Martinique in 1902 and Mount Pele in 1906 died of suffocation when earthquake dust, volcanic ash, steam, and hot gases, mostly sulfurated hydrogen gas, took the place of air. In some areas, the Book of Mormon reports, people were overpowered by the vapor of smoke and of darkness and so lost their lives. Even without volcanic accompaniments, Major earthquakes kick up, kick up a terrible dust, and according to Cyberg, are accompanied by phenomenal vapors and astonishingly thick air. In the Assam earthquake, such contamination reduced visibility to a few feet and made breathing a nightmare. According to 3rd Nephi 8.20-21, the vapor of darkness was not only tangible to the survivors, but defeated every attempt to light candles or torches for illumination. At present, intensive studies are being made of the destruction of the Greek island of Thera in 1400 BC. This catastrophe, well within historic times, is thought to have been eight times as violent as Krakatoa and is described in terms exactly paralleling the account in 3rd Nephi. Among other things, it is pointed out that the overpowering thickness of the air must have extinguished all lamps. Verse 23, And it came to pass that it did last for the space of three days that there was no light. And there was great mourning and howling and weeping among all the people continually. Yea, great were the groanings of the people because of the darkness and the great destruction which had come upon them. These three days of darkness obviously accord with the three days that the body of the crucified Christ lay in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. How appropriate that the lands of the Book of Mormon be draped in darkness to commemorate the death and suffering of their king. The coming of light each morning ought to be a reminder to all of the manner in which our Redeemer brought to an end that long night of darkness we associate with death and ought also to remind to be a reminder of the promise granted us through him of a newness of life. Now keep in mind that uh, the Bible account of the three days uh, that Jesus is in the tomb is really only a little over two days, uh, which makes us think that, that uh, the account that we have in the Bible that Jesus died on Friday may have been uh, an error in the translation or in the accounting that's done uh, that it may be a, may have been on Thursday that he died. Um, Brother Cummings, who who gave a, who wrote a paper uh, years ago, argued that uh, that the death of Jesus probably occurred on Thursday, uh, which would give the full three days of Jesus being in the tomb, uh, as the Book of Mormon shows the three full days of darkness. Verse 24, <clears throat> And in one place they were heard to cry, saying, Oh, that we had repented before this great and terrible day, and then would our brethren have been spared, and they would not have been burned in that great city Zarahemla. And in another place they were heard to cry and mourn, saying, Oh, that we had repented before this great and terrible day, and had not killed and stoned the prophets and cast them out. Then would our mothers and our fair daughters and our children have been spared, and not have been buried up in that great city Moronihah, and thus were the howlings of the people great and terrible.
So here we have the uh, the account of Jesus' death and crucifixion and what happened on the American continent during that time frame. So uh, we'll get we'll see what happens in the next couple chapters here. I bear testimony that these things are true and that this uh, this is translated material that we're reading. And I bear that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.